I am calling this show the Pintuck Extravaganza. Let's create Pintucks in the round, as well as a Pintuck and lace yoke on a doll's heirloom party dress. I simply love Pintucks. Wendy Shane is here today with some great hand embroidery stitches to share. Hand embroidery captivates me every time I look at one of my antique garments. With great teachers like Wendy, we can learn these elegant stitches with just a few instructions. I hear pen tucks and embroidery calling, so let's get started. And I really want to welcome you to my sewing room today. This is an incredibly wonderful, very tailored woman's jacket featuring all kinds of wonderful sewing techniques. Good looking uh, black linen has to be one of the greatest looks for jackets with heirloom embellishments. Starting with the collar, the mitered lace, and the wonderful tatting, beautiful machine embroidery. These double needle pin tucks, I'm gonna I have some magic for you. We're gonna do pin tucks in the round. This is just pin tucks, beautifully stitched down insertions. And down here, I promised lots of pin tucks. These are three pin tucks with a beautiful little built in machine stitch that goes in between the pin tucks. And there is just a really fun technique on pin tucks in the round. It's just something I think you'll really like. First of all, you sew your piece together. This is the uh, black linen and you just sew it together. Now there's a real trick in how you sew it together if you can just look right here. I have moved this piece of fabric over before I sewed it together one quarter of an inch. In other words, it's off one quarter of an inch before I sewed the two pieces together. Then I use my foot to guide or some kind of a guide a double needle pin tuck, one at a time, of course, that comes all the way around. Now, when it comes around the outside edge, because I moved over that little one quarter of an inch, guess what? When it comes, it starts a brand new row without my having to stop, move over, and start another row. So I just continue on using the pin tuck foot to guide. And then when I come around to the next area, it veers in. It is just simply a fascinating technique. After you do your pin tucks in the round, then it's time to do the beautiful decorative stitching. Machine embroidery has to be one of my all time favorites. This is such a beautiful antique looking design. And then in between these two pieces, we have, or not two pieces, on this, we separate these two areas with a beautiful piece of Ecru French insertion. I'm so glad to have as my guest today, Marlis Bennett. Marlis is an educational consultant with Bernina of America. Marlis, welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me back. <laughs> this is going to be fun. Pintex in the round. Pin Pintucks can be so tedious, and doing them in the round makes them go so much faster. On that gorgeous jacket you made, my friend. <laughs> Thank you. It's very, very important, as you mentioned earlier, to have the fabric offset, because if it's not offset, your foot is not going to behave properly. So it doesn't make any difference. I've already got a pintuck foot on here. It makes no difference. Uh, I'm just going to sew this down so I have the seam. Once I have the seam sewn, then the magic begins. And we'll talk a little bit about how things are set up on the machine. I have on my machine a guide right here on the foot. And this guide, I've, I've measured the distance between my pin tuck and the guide so that when I get ready to do a decorative stitch, my foot will fit exactly in between the pin tucks. Now let's sew some pin tucks. It doesn't make any difference how you do this. I have to turn it just so that I have the part that as this goes around here, I have the part that is offset going underneath the foot. And I'm just going to start sewing this way, make sure my threads are out of the way. And this may take a little bit to get around. It's really easy, you can guide your fabric right here on the edge of your foot. Just keep sewing. If you have a machine that has a start stop button on it, this is perfect because you can just keep sewing and sewing without any of the pressure of your foot. And we're ready to start meeting up here. 
You'll notice that I'm moving my threads out of the way, and okay. I do slow now down we're a little bit. Where the little offset is now. I'm slowing down a little bit. Okay. This first pin tuck is going to go okay. into the guide, where the very far guide on this side, and then it starts to sew a second pin tuck. Now, as I'm sewing, I don't really have to worry too much about how I'm sewing or how quickly I'm sewing because the foot is guiding the pin tuck from one area to the next. What a magic trick. Oh my goodness. It's great. Now It's great. The uh, when you're done I did 3 rows at a time. So we're going to pretend I have the thir third row here. Okay. This seam guide, you can, when you get to the seam where you've seamed your fabrics together, you'll pick up your foot and you'll put the guide on the outside edge of the next pin tuck. That way you don't have a lot of threads in there and you've got the space that you need for the foot, for the decorative for stitch. For that beautiful decorative stitch. Yeah, so does that make sense? <laughs> it, it makes sense, Marlis, and it is so easy. Everything you show is easy, especially when you show how to do it. <laughs> well, and then it's time for the fun little... Um, the decorative stitch. You can sew that in the round also if you want to. Now, um, let me let me get this decorative yeah, stitch why don't you and show our viewers while you're setting up there. The pin tucking with the decorative stitch is so fabulous. Let me hold the collar piece up here. This is the uh, block that has the pin tucking with the decorative stitch. This time you use just a little flower. I did. And the deck and you use this several places. I'm actually going to turn this uh, jacket around. Just let everyone see that you, you know, the Victorian clothes that I love so much mm -hmm. were always as beautiful on the back. Marlis, all of your things are always as beautiful on the back. Well, yeah, okay. there's a lot of it. And see, <laughs> if you're making a lot of squares, it's real important that you find an easy way to do that. Now, I've just picked a feather stitch here because I've still got the, twin, uh, the twin needle in here for the pin tuck. But do you see how easy the foot is? To make your decorative stitch, absolutely. Now, once you have all this piece finished, you're going to cut out. I used a template, a very simple template that you can get at any craft store and cut it to size because sometimes our rulers aren't the right size or then you have to turn it a lot. This works great. I cut out of the piece that has been pin tucked and decorated all the blocks that I needed and I do it in succession. I Here's a finished block and then here is the decorated block right here so that they're all six and a half inch squares now. And then you just, how do you join those two? I sew it together this way okay. with a quarter inch seam. Okay. It's really good. There's a patchwork foot with a guide that's available. All your quarter inches turn out perfectly. Okay. Then when it's finished, you put your lace on top using regular heirloom techniques of putting the lace down. Oh, Marlis, that is so much fun and so interesting and so easy. It is. Marlis has some wonderful sewing inspirations for you. Marlis, tell us about this fabulous jacket. Oh, this jacket is actually the same uh, pattern uh, as the black jacket that we did in the earlier segment. This one has ribbons and laces and satins used for the uh, fabric to create the fabric for the collar and the band. Just so creative and so elegant. What about this little beauty? Oh, that was very much fun. It's a, a combination of, of silks and the linen. This is has got embroidery on it to make it look like the antique fabric and a piece of silk that was pre-beaded. So I didn't have to do that. Pre-beat. So yes. you didn't have to do that one. And, and you did your embroidery on your silk organza. I did. I did so use pretty. the water-soluble stabilizer on that. This is my all-time favorite jacket right here. That's a piece of wool, and it's been embellished. Um, this is bobbin work with a little zigzag stitch and one millimeter silk ribbon, and then little pieces of embroidery um, put into the squares. So all the fabric was decorated first before I cut it out. And the same thing on the back, a little tassel on the back to add in there. And it has a nice little ple uh, pleat in the back of the jacket. And then we've got some more embroidery corner pieces. And I love your colors. Oh, my goodness. You know how I am attached to Crazy Patch. Tell uh, us about this. This was the fabric was actually uh, given to me, which was really great, by a student in one of my classes. How nice. I know. So I put it together and made this Crazy Patch vest because I do like Crazy Patch. And it, this one is a memory vest. So it has a lot of different pieces on it. A lot of buttons, some um, earrings that my son brought back uh, to me from Europe. And, and I really do enjoy wearing it a lot. 
so fabulous. And this little sweet heirloom party dress. Oh yes, this one has off the edge stitching right here done on the sewing machine so it replicates some hand crocheted Looks work. Like crochet or even tatting, but first I thought it was tatting no, up there. No, it's done with the sewing machine. It's got some embroidery and then the embroidery has been highlighted with some twin needle work and some eyelets. And then the insertion The little band. eyelets and the embroidery goes all the way around on the little, the hem. I started to say fancy band. The fancy mm -hmm. band is the part with the lace it and the is. hem. Oh, Marlis, that's absolutely adorable. Thank you for bringing all these wonderful things to inspire our viewers. You're welcome. And now Marlis has a so quick, so easy project for you. Marlis, I'm just going to tell you, ask you to tell us about that wonderful little bag you have. Oh, it's this is a cute little bag. It's made out of a tea towel, and it has a drawstring on it. And a purchase tea towel. With all purchase, those, okay. Now, I did do the decorating with the machine stitches on here. I did use a stitch regulator and did some quilting on this. So let's show oh, you how this is okay. done. This is really a lot of fun. Here's the tea towel. And to get it ready to do any type of stitch regulator work, you open it up and decide how much you're going to have folded down and get a contrast piece of fabric so that you can do your stitching on it. And I like to use one that has a nice big pattern on it. They're mm -hmm. easier to follow. This is how you get the beautiful stitching to come out on the white linen of the tea towel. So that was uh, there, free motion. Then. There's free motion and it's oh, the, pattern, the pattern's right here on this piece of fabric. Okay. This one's got a nice big flower on it. I have the stitch regulator going. Um, this regulator reads the movement of the fabric so that my e my stitches are going to be even and regulated no matter how fast or how slowly I sew. So all I have to worry about is following the outline of my stitches. Do you see how easy this is? And the stitches are so smooth and even too, aren't they? Right. And I just follow oh, all the way around. Oh, you got those pretty flowers on the outside. Yeah. Working from the back. Yeah, that's the. It's all in your choice of decorator fabric that goes on the inside. Oh, Marlis, that is fascinating. Isn't this fun? Notice that the machine keeps up whether I'm going fast or slow, and I can go from one flower segment to the next. That is so much fun. You have, you're working from the back, and you mm -hmm. have those beautiful. I turned over till we can see those. Okay. Beautiful stitches from the front, and all of this is from a piece of fabric that's lining. Oh, see? Marlis. And then you would put your decorative stitches on it, just like as if you're ready to do it and fold it over, sew up your side seam. But your whole pattern that's on the side of that little bag comes from let me, let me the inside lining. The of, whole pattern on the side of this bag came from that wonderful inside lining, mm -hmm. and your stitch regulator just made those stitches even as you flipped around there. Right, you don't have to worry about dropping your feed dogs anymore because the machine takes care of everything oh, for you. Oh my goodness, that is fun. Marlis, thank you so much for being here and bringing all these beautiful projects and your wonderful ideas thank and your beautiful things. Thanks. Thank you so much. And now we have some hand embroidery for you. I'm so happy to have Wendy Shane with me today. Wendy has published over 30 patterns under the name of Petite Pochet Patterns. She has authored four books on hand embroidery. She has studied at the Royal School in London and in Madeira, Portugal. Wendy, welcome to the show. Thank you, Martha. It's always great to be here. Today we're going to talk about stem stitch and how we can turn a stem stitch into an outline with just one small move. Um, and I brought with me this a sample of a sewing basket. It's actually a lid. And um, this is the stitch I want to talk about right here. It's, uh, it's actually the stitch we use to stitch the stems. Hence the name, I suppose. So now I'm going to move it over to the side so I can show you the hoop. Um, I work my stem stitch, an outline stitch, a little bit differently than most people do because I do it in a hoop. It tends to make the stitch a lot sturdier. It's not as floppy, in other words, and it gives a, a just a, a lovely look to it. Um, I'll show you how I tie on. I'm going to use a waist knot, and a waist knot is just a knot that you cut away after. It just holds the end of the thread before you can, for, so that you can tie on. I'm going to tie on right on the design line with a few little back stitches. Now these back stitches have nothing to do with the stitch itself. I'm just merely using that to anchor the end of the thread. And then after that's done, you can, actually, you can just forget about it and then cut off your knot. 
Now to begin a stem stitch or an outline stitch, you will be working from left to right if you're right-handed and vice versa if you're left-handed. We're going to start by coming up on the design line and take a stitch that is twice as long as you normally would stitch. So this is the longest stitch of all. It's twice the length forward. I'm going to go down in the fabric. When you go down in the fabric, hold the loop out of the way. Now, for a stem stitch, you would hold the thread down, and for an outline, you would hold the thread up. So as you can see, you can control this as you, as you would like. A stem stitch has a ropier look or a more twisted appearance than an outline stitch. So in this case, I'm making a stem with it, and I prefer to make it a stem stitch. So I'm going to hold the loop down. So now with this big long stitch, you would like you need to bring your needle into the center of between those two points. So if this is point A and this is point B, you're coming out at C right in the center. And notice the loop is being held down. I'm just going to pull the tension out of the stitch and then I'm going to take the next stitch. Now the next stitch is just half as long. So you see where my end is coming out here. This is the beginning stitch, B, that we uh, stitched for the first stitch. The next one is going to be half as long. Half as long forward, and now come out in between, um, in that same opening of the previous stitch, holding the thread down. Now I'm just going to stitch a, a few stitches so you can see how it works without me talking too much. Bring it up and around. And you can see what the thread looks like in a stem. Now, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch sides. Well, let me just make sure to do this last one correctly. Okay. Now, for an outline stitch, remember I said to hold the thread above. And um, also bring the needle in on the design line as you did before. There's nothing different about it except that you're holding the thread a different way. So um, this stitch is very, very useful in almost anything you want to do that needs a straight line design or um, just to accent another, another cluster of stitches, anything that you would like to um, emphasize. And also you can use it for some padding or some foundation work when you're doing padding stitches. Now to tie off on this stitch, well you wouldn't want to do that I hope. Let's see if I can get myself out of this jam. Okay, well. Well, let me show you how you would tie off. I'm going to bring it down. Hopefully you won't be splitting your thread like I did. Bring it around. I'm going to show the back if I can. And on the back of your work, you should have a continuous row of back stitches. So this is a great place to tie off. I usually just take my needle through and weave it under the stitch, under and over, about four or five stitches. And remember, this is being worked very largely. You would only do this just a, a fraction of an inch and um, and it's just a lovely little stitch. How do you choose the difference when you're designing? How do you choose outline? How do you choose That's stem? a very good question, Martha. Normally what I do is if the design requires a very fine line, I do an outline stitch. That means I hold the thread above. And if the design requires a heavier look, I do the stem or the stem stitch where you hold the thread down. And the stem stitch, the great part about stem stitch is you can vary the, the width of it by just holding the needle at a slight slant instead of right on the design line. Well, Wendy, this is fascinating. The basket cover is completely beautiful, as is everything you do. Thank you, Martha. And it's so nice to have you on the sewing room oh, it's today. It's my pleasure. <laughs> and now I have a doll dressing section for you. I have a magnificent heirloom party dress on my beautiful doll, my toddler doll. This, the technique I'm going to talk about today is the straight pin tucks and how you attach them to the laces and how you make a bodice like this on the heirloom party dress. This is a high yoke. And it's attached with entredeau and I especially want you to look at this beautiful fancy band which has, let's see, one, two, three, four, five layers of French lace insertion just buddied together. Entredeau at the top, entredeau at the bottom, and the beautiful ruffle at the bottom made out of lace. 
Double needle pin tucks are something that we've talked about a lot and some of you might not have ever seen a double needle. So I'm going to share with you what a double needle looks like. This is a double needle or a twin needle. And you can see it has just one piece that goes up into the sewing machine and two needles attached to it. Uh, and you can use a double needle with almost any sewing machine. Now, this is a pin tuck foot. Let me turn it where you can see the little grooves on the bottom. Do you have to have a pin tuck foot to do double needle pin tucks? No, you do not. You can just use a regular foot, but many times you can buy a double needle pin tuck foot for your machine. Now let me show you one more little trick. You can always tell if the double needle will fit the pin tuck foot if the double needles, if the twin needles will slide over one of those little grooves. Now to make this bodice, I'm going to use French lace. I'm going to butt the two pieces of French lace together and simply zigzag them. It's really that simple to do the beginning French sewing by machine. Then I can choose to make pin tucks either um, very close together as I've done here, or I can space them apart. That's one of the reasons it's so good to have the pin tuck foot, but remember you can use a double needle with just a regular zigzag foot. Okay, it's very simple to do a double needle. It's straight stitch. On heirloom double needle pin tucks, I use a short stitch, 1.5 stitch length, and by the way, I am guiding the pin tuck I've already made in the groove of the pin tuck foot. I use a 1.6 or a 2.0 double needle and I do use a short stitch 1.5 is what I usually use. It seems to me it makes the pin tucks stand up better and if they don't stand up it's really okay but I like for pin tucks to stand up as much as possible. Now after I have chosen the pin tucks that I'm going to make uh oh let me turn this around so you can see it better. I'm going to attach the pin tuck strips with the uh, butted together lace insertion using Martha's Magic, the pin tuck strips with the more uh, pin tucks with more insertion. And I make the piece as wide as I want the high yoke to be. You can see I have the pattern for the high yoke drawn off here. At that point, I take the pattern, I can put the piece over it if I can see through it. Well, I can't see through it too well. So I will cut this pattern out and put it on top of my created piece and I will cut out the yoke. When I first looked at heirloom party dresses like this, I thought, how on earth did everyone ever cut out a pattern piece and cut those curves and keep the bias strip or keep the lace from raveling? Well, the answer is you don't. You put your pattern piece down after you have created the whole piece and it's really very easy to make this beautiful doll dress. And now I have a beautiful piece from my vintage collection to share with you. This is a spectacular nightgown. I especially love the puffing that uh, goes around the neckline. It has entredot on either side and a little bit of gathered French lace. And the ribbon is run through this puffing, which has a casing, which is made into a casing. A beautiful piece of wide edging is used next. And you can see there are some little release tucks. Now these are done by hand, not with a twin needle and a wonderful pin tuck foot. These are release tucks because they only go so far. The most spectacular thing about this nightgown is tiny, tiny little hand embroidery. The word Claudia has been embroidered on this nightgown. It's so small. When you look at it first, you almost don't see it. I really like that gown and think it'd be nice for today as well as for Victorian times. I have a letter here today from Noreen Bruns, who now lives in Oklahoma City. Dear Martha, for over 30 years when I lived in Denver, I dressed wonderful dolls for the Salvation Army using heirloom techniques which I love to sew. The proceeds from the sale goes to dress needy children throughout Denver with new clothes from underwear complete to outerwear and shoes. And I had the pleasure of creating the doll clothes which were sold to earn this money. I've now moved to Oklahoma City. Thank, thank you for telling this story. Noreen Bruns, now of Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Noreen, I absolutely am thrilled that you made the beautiful heirloom doll clothes like we just shared with our viewers. You made the beautiful heirloom doll clothes and thank you for doing it for the children in Denver to have new clothes. Thank you so much for joining me in my sewing room today. I've just loved having you here and I would like to invite you to come back next time. Music